So this exhibit, 150 years of Chicago architecture, really is expressing that vitality. And you uh, get to appreciate once again what all these architects have done, past and present. And so I went to Europe and I saw the Gothic cathedrals and the Renaissance buildings in person, not the history books, but in person. And once I saw that, I realized I couldn't build a stone cathedral. But behind all of that is the geometry that makes architecture. And so I started on a search which has been going on since 1962 in the glories of geometry as it makes architecture. Because today, we don't have the disciplines of a single material. We have choices. And with these choices comes some sort of ordering discipline. And for me, geometry is my ordering discipline. I can't imagine not working in architecture. And I cannot imagine not continuing this particular exploration. Some people say, Walter, aren't you bored making these drawings? And I said, but these drawings always come out different. You, you, you walk around this exhibit, some over there look like a fish because it was a competition and the feng shui of this in terms of the culture of, of, of Hong Kong was the fish and the site was the fish, and so it was fun making the geometry begin to relate to the culture of Hong Kong and that kind of, uh, of cultural impasse that they have. In fact, the marvelous thing about that little exploration was I discovered that you have a person, a seer that comes into your office, and they say you've moved your office, and they say, you can't sit there. You have to sit over here because the feng shui of this, you're, you're the gods, it just won't work. And so when I designed this building with all the fish, I designed lots of little buildings and they all face different ways. So you could go into the hotel and you register and you say, my feng shui is this and you can face this way. And so you know, it's, it's, a kind of a, it's kind of interesting how the culture, you have Architecture works on two levels. It works on the level of reality and need, and it works on the other level of, of aesthetics and form. And you have this combination of joining these two together, which makes architecture. Uh, Chicago's had a continuity which is uh, frequently uh, brought up when people ask me why I keep my office in Chicago and work around the world. Um, the kinds of architecture we do in Chicago cannot be replicated in other cities, at least they haven't been. And I think that this uh, tradition of architecture that we've had uh, has not been just a new one since Mies or a new one since Frank Lloyd Wright. It preceded them. There was a reason for Frank Lloyd Wright being in Chicago. There was a reason for Louis Sullivan being in Chicago. There was a reason even for Richardson's great works being in Chicago. And uh, that we uh, somehow carry on with, although it's uh, not a very conscious thing. It is a profound and unconscious tradition that we are continuing with. Uh, I think everything in the world has changed its scale with the exception of architecture and building. We still conceive of buildings today with very few exceptions, uh, much as the Romans would have built them, much as uh, uh, the French would have built uh, something in the, uh, uh, in the middle of Paris uh, a couple hundred years ago. I think even the scale of their city planning and the scale of the city planning that went back as far as the 14th century was about the same uh, size, the same scale for the same numbers of people that we continue to build today. But the world has changed enormously. Uh, we, we need larger structures for more people. We, our population has increased enormously. 
uh, we are cities of 15 million people, Mexico City, for example. Uh, it used to be that 3 million people, 4 million people were, was a great number. We have to control those people uh, so far as physical accommodations are concerned. We have to provide accommodations for those people so that they remain individuals. Uh, we, uh, I'm not an architect of great numbers. I'm an architect of modern numbers, of contemporary numbers. And uh, if those uh, uh, grab people as being large numbers, well, the world around us is larger. I think looking back upon my career as an architect, I have discovered very little. What I have done is to rediscover what originally was there. Uh, the, the rectilinear spaces, the boxes that we've been building for people and building for our world are boxes that the engineers have given us with the advent of steel and the advent of engineering for concrete, it was much simpler to think of architecture being a uh, development of the straight line. But uh, it's simpler if you don't really pay any attention to how simple it might be to rediscover an egg or a shell. Uh, those forms have been with us for years. Nature has no right angles. And uh, all I have done is rediscover that we can today, for the first time in the history of architecture, relatively economically build uh, whatever we can think of. The question is, what should we think of as being necessary for our functional uh, needs, and what should we think of as being necessary for human uh, for human needs, for what we call humanism. I don't think the box answers all of those questions. Uh, I think that the crisis in our urbanism today has come from lack of community, has come from, P from the exodus to the uh, burbs, uh, the exodus away from the center of our communities. I don't think you can sit down and say, hey fellows, let's build a community. I think the, the, there has to be some sort of appeal, there has to be some sort of magnet, there has to be some sort of core to bring community action into existence. And I think the architect really must understand those uh, forces which can come together into a focal point and make it possible for people to function once again as a community.